Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Secret Resume Podcast, hosted by me, Melody Moore. In this podcast, we explore the people, places, and experiences that have shaped my guests, those which have influenced who they are as people and where they are in their work life today. You can listen in as we have a rich exploration of often unexamined and undiscussed, but very important aspects of their lives, or as I like to call it, their secret resume. My guest today is Afalabi Shonake. Afalabi, or Flabs as he's widely known, is a psychologist and the head of development and team performance at Lloyd's Banking Group. Flabs has spent much of his career as a consultant and recently became a poacher turned gamekeeper and joined Lloyd's in an internal role. So welcome Afalabi. I'm going to call you Flabs because that's how I know you. Um, sure. But yeah. Really happy to have you here today. We were just laughing about how it's funny to be doing something like this with someone that you know. Um, so we're both trying to pretend to be professionals. Or I'll pretend <laughs> and you just be professional. <laughs> no, it's it's definitely um it's uh it's different as well for me, but you know, but you know, it's quite a while, isn't it, Mel? I think like probably yeah. about 15 years or something like that. So yeah, yeah. I know, a really long yeah. time. God, we obviously we're not that old that we could know I've worked <laughs> with someone for uh from 15 years ago. So it must you must mean five, not fifteen. Yeah. That's, That's what it, it. is. Yeah. <laughs> so um clubs tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do today. Yeah, sure. So uh it's it's a new turn for me. Like I'm I'm in my first in-house role after having been consulting for 20 odd years. So it's a great opportunity, head of leadership and teams at Lloyd's, Lloyd's Bank. Um, not every day that kind of opportunity comes along. I, didn't, I wasn't looking for it, but it sort of found me, you know, through mutual former colleagues of ours. Um, uh, so, so yeah, look, you know, it's, it's, um, it's kind of having done consulting for a while, this is a new sort of runway for me yeah. doing an internal role and it's doing you know the kind of work that I love what we used to do so um yeah jackpot you know brilliant fantastic so um we're gonna leap right back now uh to the beginning obviously this is your secret resume so right back to the beginning of your story well not the very beginning but early on in your story yeah. um and that's uh when you moved here to the UK do you want mm. to say a bit about that yeah, sure. So I'm I'm from Nigeria. Um, two elder brothers. Um, they were in the UK already. I, I'd been over, and you know, so that was cool. And then you know, parents luckily decided to send me over to school as well. This is 1986, um, and um, that so I came over in the summer term, right? I mean, normally you start in September. Uh -huh. I came over in the summer term. And the intention was just to come in because my brother was in the school, my middle brother, and um, he um, he was going to be leaving, right? Because he's five years older than me. So he was going to be leaving school. So they said, we'll come over in the summer term to help sort of integrate. You know, your brother will be there in the school. Literally. So I did that, right? I, I saw him like once or twice or something. He was no <laughs> use. <laughs> it's like the first night. Obviously, I cried the first night, but he came to the dormitory and saw him on the first night. But I don't really remember seeing him at school, um, apart from being the younger brother who people wanted to get because, you know, back in those days, there was a bit of, um, what's the word, <laughs> um, colourful behaviour, shall we say, <laughs> towards between seniors and juniors. So uh, I had to deal with a bit of his legacy because I was the younger one, so they wanted to get me. So, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that. So you can listen to this as well. <laughs> no, you can, you just you just pass some messages to him via the medium of a pod yeah. podcast um <laughs> a long held grudge um what was that like coming from mm. nigeria where you're living with your family to being i don't even know how many thousand miles away that is it's a long yeah. way it's yeah. a completely different culture it's a completely different weather um <laughs> <laughs> what what is that even like i can't imagine and you're 8 years old I'm eight years old. Um, so look, well, is people often ask me that must have been so difficult, da, 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 you know, and I'm like, at the time, looking back, I can see that, right? But at the time, it was just life. Um, I'd already been to England. 
in Nigeria, I used to play cricket with my brothers and, and you know some of our friends. So we, um, so I came in the summer term. So that was lucky. And I was cricket was my best sport at school. Boys are very very simple. You know, it's like you're good, you're sporty, you kind of get in, you find friends. So so that was a godsend for me, really. But having said that, I mean, look, I'm not going to lie, it was cold. <laughs> I found it cold. Even in the summer? <laughs> yeah. I had to wear shorts. Like, that blew my mind. Like, shorts and then in the winter, you know, because the seniors were the only, the elder boys were the only ones who wore, wore trousers. So it was cold. The food was bland. Not what I was used to <laughs> at all. Um, and then also, you know, you didn't think about this, but I'd left a place where not only was I surrounded by black folk, I was surrounded by Nigerians, right? So your name, your ways, everything, it was just, and one of the things I vividly remember was, um, you know, everything's communal there, right? Boys school, boarding, you come out the shower and everything. So I, and I remember like I'd come out and I'd cream myself, you know, and there'd be this moment where I get my cream and the other English guys, my friend, yeah, friends and everything, they'd be looking at me weirdly right looking at me creaming myself and then i'd i'd be looking at them weirdly not creaming themselves so i'd be like so we had this sort of weird <laughs> thing and it was just you know that was probably the back to it my first sort of exposure of um you know the whole all of the dynamics around culture identity you know race ethnicity all of that um so so you know it took getting used to get the cold for sure but I think sport was a big, um, let me say, integrator for me. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and yeah, you know, you know, school can go either way. And luckily for me, you know, I got in friends, some still friends today, um, fewer of them, but some. And um, yeah, you know, it, it, I, I sort of made it work, I guess. Mm. Were, were there many non-white kids in the school? No, no. So I was the only black kid in my year. Um, there weren't many others. There was a, definitely another Indian chap in the year. I'm just trying to think. Um, yeah, he and I were still good friends today. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, in fact, throughout my whole school year, 10 years schooling, I was always the only black kid in my year. Mm um so in the year above or below there might have been more but that's just how it how it happened for me okay all right mm. so you're in the cold uh <laughs> <laughs> bland food yeah <laughs> oh. that's just boarding school food or just no, that's food England. generally that's yeah good. certainly in that's the 80s <laughs> come on it's got a bit better now uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um but when you were 11 Mm. It was you had a bit of a, a shake up. Is that the right uh, word to to use? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I mean, look, I um, I'm not. I'm, I was never the best academically, right? Um, I, I think I'm much in a different place now because what I'm doing is more vocational, and mm. that plays more to my strengths, right? But Nigeria, West African parents is the culture of you know. My dad's an accountant, you know, be a lawyer, be an engineer, be a professional, do so there's a lot of kind of, you know, sending your kids to England to, to learn and do great at academics and you know, all of that stuff, right? Um, I just wasn't really an academic personally. Um, so but I was in a good environment because you know it probably helped help me get better and carry me mm -hmm. a little bit, right? Um but at the same time, you know, financially, it was tough for my parents. You know, they were making a lot of sacrifices to send myself, my brothers over. And, you know, parents love their kids. But let's be honest, they also expect something in return. And, you know, uh -huh. it's not going to be for nothing, right? Fairly, fairly. So, you know, I wasn't really doing well at school. My, actually, my, my brothers <laughs> probably helped, <laughs> despite not helping me when I came, helped out to try and talk to my parents, say, you know, He's not the best, you know, academically. I mean, anyway, I wasn't doing great. I was sort of okay. And then I had a tutor as well. And there was one time when I was in Nigeria, we were back there for holidays with myself and my brothers. And um, 
my brothers went out somewhere and I was like, oh, I'll go with them, right? And in going with them, the tutor came, it was a French tutor, you know, parent again, work, right? And um, I think he came and I missed, missed the lesson, right? And so when uh, when the thing got home, my parents were definitely not happy. Like I got, I, I knew about it, that's for sure. And then they called me into their bedroom and they were like, you know, this has been going on, your work's not been, we're going to bring you back to Nigeria. You know, you're going to leave London. And I was like, whoa, okay. They've been saying this, not, not as a threat, but like now it's for real. Um, so it was about age 11. And then that evening, um, <laughs> we went to church, like as we, as we would normally do. And um, <laughs> it was... You know, whether you are of faith, any faith or no faith, but basically saying prayers, or whatever. And, and the priest like spoke to my, she spoke to my parents afterwards and was just like, no, don't, don't bring him back. Let him, you know, go to the, and I don't know, like that saved me. Like, because I was, you know, a few hours before I was, they were going to let the school know I was coming back. Uh, you know, that was kind of like, there is a God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so divine so, intervention through the priest 100 100 you know priest saying prayers talking to my parents whatever so that was um you know um yeah like i say whether, whether you believe or not like for me that was definitely a poignant time and um you know thanks to my parents they stuck at it um it was you know it was a lot of depreciation in the naira the currency versus the sterling it was hard and everything but you know, I, I'm blessed in that they stuck at it. And eventually I got through the the period where it's all about academics, you know, as a kid. And, you know, I could get through to sort of being more in my own, um, you know, and kind of what I'm doing now. Did it change your behaviour, that threat of, because it sounded like it was a proper serious, it was not really a threat, it was about to happen. Oh, yeah, 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 it was. I mean, it's funny because I remember more the moment. I, I'm sure I did because I knew this was for real, right? I'm sure I did try and work harder, um, you know, and, um, you know, maybe they could see, see I was, I was trying my best, you know, um, but I was never like in the A stream, you know, which would always say to me, be in the A stream, that's, that's what parents are. I was never at that level. Um, so, but, but I did, I did try, you know, I tried my best and, and I would get, good report you know I wasn't a troublemaker at school or mm. anything I just just you know I think missing that lesson was like is this kid is he serious you know what I mean after everything but but you know I went back and I, I did try my best and work harder and you know I made it through you know I didn't GCSEs I only got one A one A seven B's like a lot of my peers were getting more A's mm -hmm. A stars I can't remember if that was a thing back then um A levels bbd you know d not great do you know what i mean so but but i just I managed to enough to get through and then get to a place where i was doing psychology and actually now what i'm doing occupational psychology which is just much more vocational mm -hmm. and, and much more in my sweet spot mm -hmm. and were your brothers more academic so had they kind of had an <laughs> expectation set up from your brothers so one of them my middle brother, Kolo, was. My eldest brother, Laddie, wasn't. Um, but it just shows the whole thing about academia. Like, you know, that's that's what how it is early. So my middle brother, Kolo, you know, went, went for Oxford, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't get in. Went for, like, PPE, or I can't remember exactly what it was. It didn't get in. Um, but, he, you know, he's smart. He's switched on. He's a barrister now, right? So you can imagine, you know, works hard. My eldest brother not academic at all like me um but worked bloody hard and had a great career in the in the city you know um which you know that that is a grind and it requires resilience you know all the underlying stuff that mm. fundamentally is what determines whether somebody's going to be successful or not you know mm -hmm. he had that you know he had drive he had commitment all of that stuff um so so that was a mix. It was a mix. I mean, my dad's an accountant, so he, you know, he valued that professionalism, and my, my middle brother being a lawyer. But I guess, yeah, we're a mixed bag. But 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 we all work hard. Like mm. that is common across the three of us from our parents. 
uh, we all, you know, we put a shift in, we graft. Mm. And how has that influenced your, how, because you have twin boys, how does that yeah. influence your parenting of them and their academia? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, I'm for me personally, what I'm always saying to my boys is, you know, get in the habit of putting a shift in, putting effort in, right? Um, and in time, you know, that will transition to get get good at relationships with others because that's also a big differentiator. Like, mm -hmm. I know that, right? But what I'm saying to them now is the stuff that you're putting a shift, it's about your work at school, right? It's about academics, right? And you'll do whatever you do in that. But don't have a fixed mindset. You know, believe you can give it a go. Get in the habit of putting in effort um trying your best you make mistakes learn from them all that kind of stuff and whatever you end up doing you'll take that underlying stuff to that right so if if you're an academic great but if it's something else you still got that underlying raw kind of you're curious you put effort in you learn from your mistakes that's the stuff that i think is important and mm -hmm. if you're not an academic maybe like me, you've just got to get through the period of in school where it's all about grades and then mm -hmm. take that raw underlying kind of thing that you have in you and, and use it where where you land, where is your spot, you know? So that's, yeah, that's kind of what I try and help them with. But they have, they've got to get through the school stuff. They're, they're doing exams, they will be. So, you know, there's no getting away from that. No, but no one asks you now, do they, you know? I literally can't even remember. I did O levels, and I cannot, could not tell you what grades I got in what subjects. I, I can't remember. Yeah, it's, it's not it's relevant. A, not a thing. But if you're not somebody who's going to put a shift in, and what you know, that will that will affect you now. You know, yeah. so I try yeah. to cultivate that. Yeah, so I always worked hard. I just wasn't smart. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not book smart. Uh, no, not book smart. Exam no, no. Spot, not, smart. Not yeah. Smart. Yeah, no. Okay, um, so let's jump forward a bit. Um, mm. And I think this was after university. So you studied um, psychology, as all the yeah. best of us do. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, but then when you left university, things didn't quite go as planned. Yeah, yeah. You know, and this is this is probably the resilience thing, right? Um, you know. I, Initially, it was great. I, I, I left uni, I traveled around the world for 14 months. Fantastic. Um, everyone else had done a gap year in between school and uni. My dad was like, no, I want to see you through uni. West African, Nigerian dad kind of thing. So fine. So I did that, went through uni, traveled around the world. Great. Um, came back in about 2000. And um, I've, I only got a 2-2. Hence, that, you know, not, you know, I just missed that, about 59%. Right? You, you and I are the same. We are the <laughs> same go. person, Flaps. There you go, you see? <laughs> so, so, you know, and I busted to get it. I was like, one more percent, because it made a difference back then, getting on jobs and graduate milk rounds and all that kind of stuff. So I didn't get on, came back, um, you know, you had a great time, but need a job, you know, broke, need a job. Um, support family support so not like um you know ends meet ends you know make an ends meet or anything um so i'm i'm hustling around looking for work um i get a job in recruitment great um somewhere in, in this timeline like i did that for a couple of years but it wasn't a job for me it's sales and mm -hmm. you know as i look at it now like i say sort of that's that's just sales or or recruitment or the only other job is more sales or more recruitment right um so i leave that um go and get a master's but in amongst all of this you know i need to get job i need to get a job i get a master's i in oxide great and then i'm really looking for work and you know trying to get professionalized in this and it's really really hard to find work there's there's hardly any jobs um so i'm like down and I'm still hustling, sending out CVs, you know, this is the hustle comes in, you know, the work hard. And you know, in amongst this, I'm not getting any money. You know, luckily I'm at, I'm at home, but you know, my dad is like, you know, go and sign on um, for, for the doll. And I'm like, 
it's blowing my mind. I'm, I'm not going to curse, but I'm like, what the, what, what's just going, what did you just say? Because I'm like, my dad, who's so proud and, you know, her parents work hard, send, you know, they, they, they have great respirations. So I'm like, this is crazy. Like, what are you doing telling me to sign on? Anyway, um, that hit my pride because I'm like, this is not the aspiration I have for myself. Um, but I kind of trusted my dad as well, <laughs> you know, because I knew that he wouldn't, you know, he's, he's given me advice for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. so, so I went and I signed on and um, that was difficult. But then you get a bit of money and, you know, <laughs> you kind of move on because you need it. And, uh, and then anyway, long story, you know, like still hustling, looking for jobs. I find a job, you know, I go to a place and I say, listen, I'll come and work. I've done my master's. This is work I want to do. I'll come and work for free. I just need you to pay for my travel to the office. Mm -hmm. Right. They took me on as an intern. Great. I think I could still stay signed on, I think. And then a few months late, because, you know, you can't have a job. And obviously, because so, mm -hmm. I was an intern. So then a few months later, they do recruitment, and they offer me the job. Brilliant, happy days. And I go and I, you know, I go and tell at the, the employment, the job center, yep, yeah, I've got a job, you know, I'm signing off now. Great, happy days, you know. So, so I'm, you know, great, starting a new job and everything. And then a little while later, I'm kind of saying to my dad, this is like years later, I'm like, dad, how come you told me to sign on? Like, that can't have been the whatever. And I thought he was sort of doing like the reverse psychology on me. Mm. Like you go and sign on and, um, you know, you won't like it and it will push you harder to get a job. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I thought that was what he was doing. We never spoke about it. But I said, was that what you were doing? And he was like, no, I just, I paid my taxes and my insurance. <laughs> so <laughs> you, shouldn't, you shouldn't get the benefit of that. So. <laughs> it's very pragmatic. <laughs> yeah, it's like, paid into the system and if you need it you should use it so I'm like yeah. fair enough that's fine you know so it wasn't it wasn't the profound moment but I guess it was profound because I um you know it, it still sits with me and it just reminds me of the the hustle the whatever mm -hmm. the pride the desire to get up and go and you know I wanted more for myself and did, so yeah, even though yeah. that wasn't your dad's intention did it have yeah. that impact on you that because you okay. felt it, you felt it to to have to go and do that yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. like that was that was never my aspiration um for myself you know and even though I wasn't an academic I still wanted you know I've got that achievement motive we talk about right mm -hmm. so so I still wanted stuff and that's that was I was never satisfied with that you know but I had no I, I needed something you know you know I could have tried and asked my dad or whatever but he didn't he, you know for money but that that wouldn't have worked for me either you know you're at a point where you want to be doing stuff so it did it did motivate me for sure um and um it probably had the effect that because I said I trusted my dad I was like maybe this is what he's doing so it did mm -hmm. it did work it did motivate me and, you know, <laughs> I, kept and I, I was that's why I went and volunteered I said listen I'll work for free you know yeah. and and luckily that was my in and you know I've not looked back since then yeah. And speaking of your dad, one of the things that you told me is really how, you know, your family and your upbringing has had a really strong impact on you mm. and, and how you think and who you are. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, blessed with my parents, um, my, you know, I, I got different things from them. You know, my mum was, was unbelievable in, um, you know, helping me sort of helping an element of independence as well, you know, um, just the stuff at home, learning how to cook, you know, being in a home, all of that kind of stuff. Um, my mum, you know, discipline, um, you know, she was, she was a no-nonsense woman, basically. So again, the graft, the hustle, you know, I saw a lot of that in her. She worked she brought us up you know both my parents worked and and also just the values you know humility and and um helping others and you know um and and my dad as well like <laughs> I'm, I'm i think of my 
you know, I'm his spitting image in a way. Like he says to to my wife Nana, is like, if if you want to know who you're marrying, <laughs> look at me. Yeah, <laughs> look at me. You know, this is going to be him in thirty years, kind of thing. You know, so so you know, counsel, advice, looking up to somebody as as a as a boy looking up to somebody as a man and 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 seeing stuff and just um you know and for both my parents the fun times the laughter you know with my brothers bringing us up um and just the um values like humble values and you know not they were never extravagant my parents um and if they were but there was still a level of humility to them you know and not kind of the big wild whatever so um so yeah that that was just priceless and and being a big big shaper for, for mm -hmm. me i'd say mm -hmm. yeah. okay uh well you we were talking about uh not being big spender i was admiring your top and you were telling me that you <laughs> wear your clothes <laughs> till they fall apart so is that something you've got from uh, that's from, from them <laughs> that's that's from my dad wearing the clothes <laughs> until you cannot wear them anymore so and that that was my mum and dad would go because my mum would it's kind of like Nana and I, right? My mum would always clean out his stuff. And I had like this top you see now is because Nana got tired of the one I was, <laughs> so I was wearing. a scrappy husband. Probably, yeah, fraying. And she knew I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw it away. I just wouldn't. But so she went and bought some other ones. And I was like, thank you with gritted teeth. Because uh, <laughs> there's a message in there what she's trying to tell me. So it is a nice top. Though, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is a very nice top. <laughs> <laughs> I would wear it. Um let's talk a bit about uh actually where you and i first met each other so uh the organization i guess we could say the name hey group um yeah. doesn't exist anymore um as such um that's somewhere you really found your feet what tell us about that yeah i mean uh, you know i think you and i will testify it can take a while for you to find your feet in hay because there's a lot of mm. you know nuances peculiarities and subtleties and everything but you know as I look back I mean what a place um what an experience for fifth well 11 how many years before it, it became Corn Ferry um like yourself you met brilliant people good people just good human beings who are friends still we're not under the same house but we're still in touch um brilliant people at work i mean there was like proper depth and expertise there mm. like really really strong stuff and um you know you look at it and i was just like it was great to be in that environment and to learn from it you know real real depth real you know and, and the people now you know you think like from there and then lastly you know in care I've, you know mentors for me from there like I think about Gina you know in okay. the top team space still in touch with her like she's a mentor for me you know I still you know love her and everything like that um and there, there were others you could think about you know um but um I love the work Mel you know it was great this is where the vocational stuff like I've now mm -hmm. I got two one in the masters right I got two one in the masters <laughs> of course <laughs> But that's because that was that was in my space now. It was vocational mm. stuff that I understood and I can do. And now I'm working on it in Hay with with great clients, great colleagues. Um, yeah, yeah, there was there was stuff that really annoyed you and, and upset you at times, sure. Where where wouldn't but overall, you know, so so all the stuff that you pick up, it was it was it was great. And and you know, my my in the job that I'm in now, um my dad just like he was like it's it's like your dividend this job now I'm like what do you mean and he said well all the stuff you know you think about time and time again and hey you just did this thing over and over again and you got really good at it and mm -hmm. you did it with different clients and you saw different problems and now having had all of that to be able to bring that to bear in an in-house role like I've got really strong foundations there you know um and and listen great great people the Tolba, you know, Friday night, <laughs> you know, no, around the corner, the everybody can complain about the local pub. 
but you'd always go there and when it closed down it's like ah where are we gonna go <laughs> that just killed it for us didn't it and when it yeah, wasn't the yeah. same once they closed it down yeah so it's a really great place to work um great experiences learned a lot fantastic people a lot of them still friends now um like anywhere you've got to know how to maneuver your way through the 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 system as well but you know what did you what did you learn there about that kind of progression and that kind of you know because it's not about academic uh, achievement anymore um you know what what did you learn about how to progress and what was important and look it took me a while now <laughs> it took me a while to learn it but um um you i i'm not i was never massively a self promoter right um i was the naive meritocracy work kind of more in that space not exclusively mm-hmm. but more in that space right um and then you just get frustrated because you your career stands still and and you see that others don't and you're like what's going on and you want to leave and you get annoyed and this and that um so it got to a point really where i was like i had to find a way to rationalize for myself doing my own self promotion because um let's be honest it's about relationships mm-hmm. at the end of the day right in a consulting firm you know would i put you on my project will i put you in front of my client can i vouch for you you know it's all relational stuff right because they assume that you can do the job um so i had to i had to i had to realize mel that when i was over here in this country doing this work and it was great and i was getting good feedback my boss didn't necessarily know about it mm. right because they were elsewhere in another country whatever right um so i had to find my own way of of making it known that i'm doing great work as well you know and i i can progress and i can operate at the next level right um so when i had that realization i rationalized it that i'm going to tell you about the stuff i'm doing right not from a self promotion perspective but we're in a consultancy right we sell time and expertise to clients right so if i'm doing great stuff over here and i think it's going to help you with your client over there i can help you i'm going to let you know about it right so and in in turn it's also doing great promotion for me right and it started to help people understand more and more about what i could do and my skills and all of that stuff you know so i needed my own way which i think everybody does in that kind mm-hmm. of environment mean, you'll know what you went through but i needed my own way to to be able to do a bit of self promotion to add to not instead of well <laughs> maybe in some people you could say instead of <laughs> So you, name no you, names <laughs> you know you might have to edit that bit. No, no, um, but but what did i have to do to add to to let people know that no i can do this stuff you know and i'm i am ready to progress and promote to the next level you know and you know hey whilst it was great it had the quirks like i remember one at one point being told yeah you know the feedback is you can't you know you're not really seen as somebody who can manage projects um i was like what um so at the time i was moving house and getting mar- and you know getting married right through that oh uh, and by the way in mbti speak cuz like i'm an istj <laughs> like i am the project manager <laughs> i know it, i remember you telling me that and i was like what do, do these people know you <laughs> so you know so i like i am the plan for one in any you know so so it's that that's the kind of the stuff that you had to you know whilst it was a great place you had to swallow up and like where did you get that from and it it eats at you and da, 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 da. so then you have to you know you fall down you have to this is the hustle right this is the resilience you have to get yourself back up if you don't agree with it you have to find your own way get me on a project show that you can do it talk about it to other people you know so i guess i learned the importance of the um you know the relational bit and and underlying that finding the and this is the more important bit right finding an authentic way for me mm. to do that stuff that perhaps wasn't so comfortable 
um, you know, that you kind of had to do because with the best one in the world, you're in a consulting environment. So you're here, there and everywhere. <laughs> you know, you, people are just not going to necessarily know. So you've got to do that self-promotion. And, yeah. But that's true in life, you know? Yeah. I think it's really interesting what you're saying about finding a way to do it in a way that felt comfortable to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you don't have to be like other people, but you still have to do it. Yeah, look, until until I found that now, I couldn't, you know, that that for me was a different point in the career, you know, yeah. because otherwise people see through it. You, uh -huh. It doesn't come well. People know what you're doing. But because I could rationalize that I've done great stuff here. You I know you're doing this with your client. You would benefit from knowing mm -hmm. about this let me come and tell you or then you have to go and talk talk to it at a you know a colleague thing we're doing mm. you know that was how i rationalized the self promotion angle of what you got to do yeah yeah absolutely um let's talk about uh so this would have been um later on uh i guess we probably yes we transitioned to being corn ferry by this point probably but, yeah. um the uh, you know and it's something that really you know part of the reason I asked you to come on this podcast is because of of what happened then and how your reaction and response really you know affected me and touched me and other people that we know which was the the murder of George Floyd and yes. you know what happened uh in the US but you know around the world as a result of that can you you know, you wrote a LinkedIn post, which for me was just incredibly powerful. And I'm assuming it's still up there. I'll link to it in the, yeah. the show notes. But let's talk a little bit about how you felt, what your reaction was. Mm. Yeah. So um, George Floyd, yes, I think it's May 2020 when that happened. So my boys, my kids, I think they're eight, eight years old by this time. And they've already, <laughs> different to me, right? Different to me, because I came over here when I was eight years old. Um, I hadn't experienced any kind of, uh, you know, I talk about cream in my hands as a kid, but I, you know, I hadn't experienced anything before I was eight years old from a, you know, race and ethnicity perspective, right? But they already had, by the age of five, um, in school, um, comments like, um, you know, this group wasn't didn't do very well because there's you know three out of five of them are black right the kids you know um you see this is in the article like um you know you should eat poo because your skin is brown like poo kind of thing you know so these are these are and i'm always astounded when people are like oh the next generation they'll be better and you know i'd be like eh. yeah i feel <laughs> the same i i yeah i i have a similar uh yeah. skepticism yeah. I don't buy it. So, so basically, right, they've been experienced to this kind of stuff, right? Now, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll speak for the school and everything, but what I'd also been doing, though, perversely was, and, you know, it needs to be both, but what I've been doing exclusively was helping them get better at the stuff they were going to face into, right? About their identity, about their ethnicity. I was helping them learn how to deal with it you know about not being proud about being black and saying they wanted to be white like i'm so all my energy is going in to that pre pre george floyd right um why i don't know i i somehow came through it you know i was the only black child in my year i think i was lucky that i was going back to nigeria in the holidays not all of them but most of them so it helped me keep strong with my identity mm -hmm. you know and my family and everything friends so i'm like um, so i'm like my kids are not so i've got to help them so i'm putting all my effort into helping them almost put on that armory to deal with the stuff that i know is going to come flying their way right um then george floyd happens and around about this time in corn ferry you know my other mentors the sages, as I would call them, you know, Audra and, and Rolando, um, we're doing a load of power of choice stuff with them, mm. right? And, you know... I just, uh, just because at this time, you had started getting involved more in diversity and inclusion work yes. prior to this, hadn't you? And yeah, Rolando and Audra, sort of great luminaries in the Conferry world in that 
in that type of work and you were yeah. working with well we were both working with them both yeah yeah absolutely yeah so i i guess because i was always doing facilitation stuff right mm -hmm. i'd actually done dni that first role where i said you know I've, i'll work for you for free i'd actually done a dni training there mm -hmm. we did less of it at hay um but you know came in and you know just started to do more of it when because which are, you know when they were acquired into corn ferry so so i'm doing work with them right sages brilliant people you know i'm still in touch with them and um and uh, one of the tenets in that is, it's not just, a, it's, it's a shared responsibility, this stuff, right? It's not just um, the, the individual, it's also the system and the managers. So, so I'm talking, and then, you know, then George Floyd happens and I'm in this room and I'm, you know, one day I'm just like, start banging on the on my laptop, start writing, writing, bang, 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 bang. And that's the, the blog that you refer to, you know? And so I don't remember the sequencing, but in a wrap, the sequencing, but in and around that time, I have a kind of a, hang on a minute. All I've been doing is helping my boys, you know, who at this time, uh, what, seven, eight, whatever, George Floyd, all I've been doing is helping them get stronger at dealing with the inappropriate stuff they're going to live with, right? What am I doing to actually challenge that inappropriate stuff out there with my voice? And it kind of, you know, came to me that, you know, with the fortunate education I've had, with all of the love and support from my parents, being comfortable in my identity and where I come from, whatever, you know, the the stuff that I've been doing at work and the stuff that I've learned at Hay, like, I need to say something, you know? Um, it, would, I, it would be wrong of me not to be able to use that and draw on that. Um, so it's not that I didn't, I wouldn't help my voice, but I started to turn my voice outwards more um because i'm like this ain't right <laughs> this is not it's not about me helping them get stronger to deal with this it's about well let's actually talk about some of this stuff as well you know so that was i think a big non-consciously a big big driver for the piece that i wrote the blog i'm not a writer um my middle brother is um you know but so that that just um I just I just started banging, you know, typing and you know, so so when it comes to you, you just go with it, you ride the wave. And when I look back and after doing it, I think that was a bit of getting me to sort of talk out there. And then obviously doing more of the work with Audra and Rolando, that sort of added that as well. And you know, now I started to turn my voice a bit more outwards about some of this stuff, not necessarily with posts on LinkedIn, but even in work with other people or the work you're doing. Um because yeah, it's like I'm not just gonna say my boys need to get better at this. Like that's nonsense. Mm. <laughs> you know? Well, and I know that what you did and what you wrote and the, you know, some of the people that you spoke to internally, that had a really profound effect on them. You I think I've told you because you didn't necessarily know that. No. But hearing there's something so powerful about hearing from someone they know and they trust and they respect. And and understanding, you know, just some aspects of your life that they had no idea about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, I always think with with diversity, there's something, and inclusion, there's something around knowledge mm. is really important. And, yeah. um, you know, a lot of us are acting in complete ignorance because we have yeah. no, just no understanding of other people's lives and what yeah. they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, look, totally, totally, Mel. And I think, um, you know, it was it's sad that it took it, but it was a, an awakening moment for a lot of people and probably opened the door to, to more conversations for many. And, you know, and also private reflections. Like, you know, I, it, it took me back to, for example, you know, I would talk about this, but I remember when I, when I was sort of, I don't know, 25 or whatever, whatever age, you know, I'd be going out, out, come back home, and I'll be walking home late at night, right? And if you were walking towards me, Mel, when I'm walking home, right? I, I don't see myself, I'm, I'm chill. I'm not a threat, right? No. But subconsciously, Mel, if you were walking towards me, I'd cross the road, mm -hmm. right? I'd cross over the road and walk the other way, right? Uh, they're on the other side. Now, 
I was saying this to some people and we had a laugh and they were like, oh, that's really considerate that you were doing this to protect, you know, the, the woman who, who was walking towards you. And look, I get it and understand it and there's horrible things that, that happen and, you know, and, and we had a joke about it. I was like, yeah, and I was doing it to protect me as well. <laughs> like, mm. You know, to kind of, I wanted to go away from anything that I might be seen as a potential threat or risk, mm -hmm. you know. That's not saying, of course, like it's a big issue. You know, we've seen everything in the news with with the that the happens to, to women, you know, outside later night. But subconsciously, you know, I, I'm not I, I'm not today who I was when I was 25. Like I wasn't thinking about this stuff, but something in me was like, this is a situation, and I'm just gonna take control and go over and then walk. You know, mm. so so but so then being able to tell people like that's stuff that I think about. <laughs> you know <laughs> that's that's my day-to-day -day, you know um or when I was when I'd be running to the tube right um to catch the tube like you say like you or others if you what you may not know but there's a joke about you know a black guy running like it's like what, what's he done like that that's you know so so that I carry that like I think yeah. about that you know um so it joke or like assumptions not a joke like you know prejudices it could be in some mm -hmm. so um so you know so i guess it allowed for to be able to voice some of that stuff and say you know yeah that's my reality you mm -hmm. know uh you know me you see me as flabs and it's all happy days oh, but yeah. yeah that's that's my reality you know yeah yeah no i think it was definitely a wake-up call and, and like I say it was it really touched me just reading it um yeah, it's always stuck with me um you know uh and like I say I think it's when you hear it from someone you know well it yeah. perhaps lands differently it touches differently um from reading something from or hearing from someone you don't know so well well thank you thank you let's uh talk about uh leaving Corn Ferry so mm. what prompted mm. you to do that? Um, yeah. <laughs> because that was a few years later, wasn't it? A few years after that. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, so I guess I am, um, you know, let's be honest, Corn Ferry is a different entity to Hay. Um, I'm, I'm sort of going along, still happy, still doing my stuff. But before that, um, some of our hay colleagues in the US, so it was um, Steph Sloan, I think, if I remember rightly, she just put me in touch with another hay colleague a guy called Jeff. And, you know, I was having chats with him and he was actually leaving mm -hmm. Corn Ferry at the time. And, and, you know, you just have a chat. And I, I remember when it was like, at some point, you felt like if you were, or at least I felt like if I was talking to other firms, like, oh, that's a really bad thing to do. It's like you're cheating on, on you know. <laughs> you're being unfaithful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? um, but I talked to him and he, you know, he was like, we had a good chat. And basically, the thing that he said that stuck with me is like, it's always responsible to be looking out for you and your career. And that really stuck with me because it was like, you can go and talk to other people. You can look and it's what it helps you know what you want to do and also what you don't want to do. Um, it helps you know if you're happy where you are or fundamentally not happy where you are because you can see what else is out mm -hmm. there. And let's be honest, if an organization needs to get rid of you, they will get rid of you. Um, so, so that was a really powerful message to me, right? And then I, I sort of added that to another great colleague of ours, Tiffany. Um, I remember her once saying to me, you know, you talk about people being self, people don't want to be selfish, right? So they become selfless, you know, and, and give themselves for everything else. And, you know, Tiffany, great colleague, fantastic coach and everything. She was like, there's a middle ground of being self-responsible, you know, where you're putting your own mask on as well so you can help others you know um and you know so those and that's the great thing about when work because you're with like brilliant people who can mm. you know you bounce off you know so those sorts of things made me then realize listen i'm happy here but i've got to be responsible and look out for my career and and if the right thing comes along be ready to to look at it you know and 
and then the right thing did come along. I got you know headhunted um, to to Wondrous, so much smaller consultancy, but I got a great vibe, brilliant. You know what they were trying to do. You know, yeah, I've moved on from there, but I loved it. It was great. You know, great people again. Um, real sort of really meaning the the work of being. Uh, you know, the thing that we coined there is about being deeply human. The work that we do. You know, um, and you know, so various people had spoken to me. I didn't necessarily, um, you know, extend all of them. But then I got the headhunter, and I did my. He called me up, and I was like, "Listen, I'm not really looking." And you know, he saw me coming because probably everybody <laughs> says that to the headhunter, right? He's like, "Yeah, yeah, whatever." So you know, he told me about it, and you have conversations, you have more conversations, and then Jeff's words are kind of ringing in my ear you know being self-responsible is ringing in my ear and and then I start to ask myself the question you know at this point I don't know how old am I I'm just over 40 at this point so I'm like am I just going to retire at Corn Ferry like yeah it's, it's a good place but it's good. there could be more there could be more out there and step out and, and have a look and um so yeah so so I did and you know I'm happy for it um great experience um but it was really that conversation and it's one that i pass on to to others now to say look you know you're doing the responsible thing to be to be scanning and, and having conversations you don't have to take it but but know what's out there and know whether you're happy where you are or actually now is the right time to move on and and, and back yourself mm. something about knowing your worth isn't this yeah worth. yeah yeah totally because um because if you don't scan and benchmark and find out what's out there you won't you'll just think that the only option is where you are and and you know what could you be missing you know so mm -hmm. so this it's nothing against corn ferry it's nothing against you know, wherever i've left but it's kind of like what else is out there mm -hmm. what could you be missing you know um there's a world of opportunity you know and that then led you on to where you are now so with lloyd's yeah so again headhunted Yes. The pattern yeah. hair flaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Again, you know, going back to the chat with Jeff, right? It was like, um, um, yeah, I'm swimming along, happy at Wondrous, you know, great people, loving the work that I'm doing. I'm doing, D, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing D&I, I'm doing leadership, I'm doing, you know, involved in coaching, talking with clients, great clients, learning lots. Fantastic, you know? And then um, my now sort of boss, boss, Sharon, um, through, and this is the great thing about Hey, right? So this was through a former mutual colleague, Hannah, who, you know, um, you know, Sharon's at Lloyd's, she's looking at what she wants to do. Um, we, we, our paths crossed because Sharon was at Vodafone, I was at Hey. Vodafone, hey, great con um, mm -hmm. client. I didn't work with Sharon at Vodafone at the time, but we knew of each other. We had mutual contacts, right? So, you know, the opportunity comes along and I'm going along at hey, and I'm like, hey, you know, it's not every day you get a call from CPO of, of a FTSE, whatever we are, I should know this, 5, 10, whatever we are, <laughs> business. FTSE uh, something. FTSE something, you might have to take. Um, it's not every day you get a call, you know, from from that, right? So whilst I was happy, you're like, you're gonna, you're gonna take the call, right? You're gonna oh. take the call. So, you know, um, we have chats and um and uh and I'm kind of like, you know, um this is a the role is head of leadership and teams. It's buying the kind of stuff that I love. Um it's what we're doing at Lloyd's Bank, I think, you know, we're, we're trying to sort of go through transformation right now and a really big transformation in the financial industry. Um, so, you know, the, the agenda that Charlie, the CEO, has put out is, you know, it's, it's ambitious, it's out there. And, and I'm like, wow, you know, what a great thing to try and be a part of and play a role in, you know? Um, so there's, there's those two reasons. And then the third reason, I'm kind of like, you know what? Um, I, I wasn't necessarily looking and thinking about an internal in-house role, you know, I didn't go look for it, but the opportunity presenting itself, I'm like, this is a new and different challenge for me. Mm. 
you know, I've been consulting for 20 odd years. Um, what, what an opportunity, <laughs> you know, and, and then I start talking to people, you know, I start talking to people who've worked with Sharon before. I go to my mentors, I go to Rolando, I go to Gina, I go to Audra, you know, I go to another you know, friend of mine, Akeno, who's like, my brother's was my brother's best man, you know, like, these are like met people who I value their opinions. And I'm like, this is going on. What do you think? And, um, and you know, it's just like, listen, it's a, it's a great new experience for you. It's a great new challenge. You've been on the outside, you've been consulting, going, coming, going, coming, you know, be in something, see it through, have to deal with the, the, you know, the stakeholdering, the stuff you've got to do and, you know, what it is. And, and, you know, so for all of that, Mel, I just thought, yeah, you know, this is, um, it's a new different challenge. It's a new runway for me now, you know, I'm only 45, God willing, I've got, you know, many years ahead. And a lot, it's yes. like, yeah, you know, so, <laughs> so I thought, what a great role, what a great opportunity. And it's a different challenge for me. It was hard leaving Wondrous, I'm not going to lie. Like, they're great people, still friends today, work with them still. They put a lot of investment to bring me along. But I had to be self-responsible as well, you know, and it, it was hard. I'm not going to lie. Like, um, but it's not every day this kind of opportunity comes, no. you know. No. Um, so, yeah, so I, t I took the step and here I am at, at Lloyd's um, in-house. So, yeah. And how is it different being... Uh, I just wrote a note to myself, poacher turned ga gamekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how is it different being in-house versus being an external consultant? Well, I guess I know the game. <laughs> I can put it that way. <laughs> That's, That's true. <laughs> you know, uh, but but having said that, I also want to be, um, I also want to be considerate of that as well. Like when I'm talking to external partners, talking to, so I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I want to be real. You know, I don't want to kind of, I, you know, whether there's opportunities or not, I just want to be straight up, you know, and I don't want to ask people to do work. I'm like, there's nothing here kind of thing. Um, the difference, um, so what I miss is, you know, you walk into the hay or, or Wondrous or whatever, and, you know, um, you definitely miss being around other, let's call it consulting colleagues, right? And what you get from, what I would call thought leadership that just has to be in the ether of, mm. of that sort of space of work. You definitely miss that. All right. Um, at the same time, what I value and appreciate is when you're consulting, you're brought in when it's kind of the work is ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm learning now is all of the stuff you've got to do to get stuff ready to go, you know, um, which, if I'm honest, I ran away from back in 2003 when I got my first job, you know, when I was mm -hmm. volunteering, because I wanted to do the doing, right, that that we got at Hay, and then for me at Wondrous. Um, but now, you know, it's the, it's the scale is bigger. With, we've got a big transformation. It's, it, you know, I'm in it to try and play a role in seeing that through. And like my dad said, it's my dividend of all the stuff that I've done. I'm trying mm -hmm. to bring it to bear in one big, massive project, mm -hmm. you know, one big, massive piece of work, which is which is exciting. Um, and I'm I'm additive in that it's not just consulting the work that you're doing. It's all the other stuff you've got to do. Like I've got a team. I had a team before, but, you know, there's, there's that, there's that, there's there's all the cajoling and stakeholdering around that you've got to do internally, in-house. Um, and uh, but but it's great, you know. I'm 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 definitely not looking back. Fabulous. Right, I'm going to throw some uh, more quick fire questions at you before we finish, if that's all right. Sure. Um, so first one I ask everybody is, what is your advice to your younger self? My advice to my younger self. Um, I think. I think you don't know what you don't know. So, so, so being kind of curious and open and experimenting 
it's a bit ironic because I stayed in Hay for 15 years or whatever. But um, and that that was great because it got me depth. But I I think if I could go back, you know, just being open, experimenting, and you just don't know what's out there. What yeah. what you so there's just the the range of learning you can get, right? So you live through your kids. You know, I'm always saying to my boys, keep an open mind. You know, you might not see the thing now, but and that you know, my mum would say that to me. My dad would say that to me. You know, to keep an open mind. Um, you know, you might not see how it benefits you now, but you might look back and think, oh, that was mm. great, you know. Mm. So so that that sort of staying open and curious, because you just don't know what you don't know. And um, you know, I think I think just because you don't see the utility immediately doesn't mean it's not gonna help you or it might take you down a path you you didn't conceive. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I hundred percent agree on that. Um Second question, which I don't ask to everyone because we're recording this in Black History Month or UK Black History Month mm. at the moment is happening. Mm. And I'm curious as to what you think about Black History Month or, you know, that kind of uh, mm. celebration, whatever we want to call it. Yeah, it's an interesting one because, like, you know, growing up in Nigeria till I was eight, like, it, you know that your identity uh, that wasn't really it was that's just your everybody's like not just black everybody's Nigerian mm -hmm. you know um so so here but so what do I think about it I think it's a good thing in some ways because I think it's good to spotlight and start to talk about stuff that you know if you're an underrepresented or um groups you you don't it's hard to spotlight you know, because the norm is not of what you are kind of thing, you know? So it's good, it's helpful to do that and bring attention to it, right? And the celebration of things, you know, at the same time, um, and I think maybe this is changing, you know, a lot of the talk of black history goes back to slavery. There's, there's so much more, right? There's so much more. But the big thing for me though is, you, you would say Black History Month, right? For me, it's not black history. It's not black history, it's British history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, you know, and, and you know, it's down to who controls the pen, right? Because we don't talk about some things in British history, right? That's black history, like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, it's like you, you look, there's, there's lots of things in terms of paying off the bond, that's not talked about in history. You know, the Industrial Revolution, go and look at, go and look at the links of all of that, you know? Um, that's British history, mm. right? Um, you know, the Middle Passage, that's British history, <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, the, uh, whatever, um, you look, look at India, that's British history, you know, partition. Yeah, it's over there, that's British history. So, so, so I think, you know, we have to be careful in terms of what you think about it and, you know, what's conveniently somebody else's history rather than a lot that has contributed to, you know, the state of the nation today. But actually, ultimately, what I would really like is just more talk about, you know, the great achievements of, of people that we don't know or hear about, you know, so... Septimus Severus, um, Ignatius Sancho, you know, Lewis Harold Latimer. These are great names. Mary Seacole, Mansa Moose. Like, what are the achievements of some of these people that that are just not because it's about who controls the pen? And and for me, it would have been great to learn more about these these because it can be inspiring. You can believe you can do X Y Z. You know. Um, now look, I get you know. I'm, you're in the UK, so you'll learn certain history, but even the history in the UK was quite kind of discreet, what, what, what you learned about. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd have a play for talking and showing more great achievements of, mm -hmm. um, you know, more folk, more black folk, particularly right. all year round, not just all, in October. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Um, uh, another question, what would be an influential book for you? What would you recommend for people? Um, oh, 
Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think I referred to it earlier, but it would it, for me it would. I, I'm not an academic, so I'm not really a bookworm. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I had to read lots of my dirt, yeah. But but I read vocational stuff, um, mm-hmm. and the power of choice, um, I think, is by Michael Heiter, you know, ex or whatever. Um, again, all of the work from Audra and Rolando, um, you know that is just priceless for me and I, I i did work in it you know helping others underrepresented talent development but also for me and it's for everybody it's not just for underrepresented talent mm-hmm. but also for me it's just brilliant and you know the principles that i take from there this idea of you know life by design you know not by default so i am i'm i've got agency on what i do mm-hmm. right it's not down to somebody else it's about me right what's in my gift to control and influence um we're psychologists right so your thoughts inform your behavior like that's that's just gold dust for a psychologist right so that is a key principle you know how i think about stuff that's going to affect how i show up so if i can power of choice if i can be more adept and controlling in my thoughts um you know i'm gonna that's gonna land better for me um and then the other principle around it's 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 my response, not the stimulus. Mm-hmm. I mean, like Roger Rolando, Michael Heider, like Jeff Howard, all of those people, fantastic. Like that is just genius for me because I I don't control what somebody throws at me or my kids. They don't control what I can control is my response to that thing, um, and that's that's really kind of liberating, you know kind of emotional intelligence self-control on steroids mm. but you know. well it's victor frankel isn't it that we're well that's yeah. certainly where i see a, the quote often you know uh from him about there's basically that gap between you know the stimulus yeah. and the response and that's, that's where it. you have choice that's it is in the gap yeah genius absolutely. stuff right yeah Genius. absolutely absolutely yeah. and like you say we have used it a lot with underrepresented talent but it applies to everybody it's everybody. completely it absolutely lessons for all of us mm. um last question is uh can you think of a title or a strap line for your story mm. um I would have to say, oh, there's a lot that comes to mind. You know, you've got to be good at relationships and so. But I would have to say, and this is counterintuitive, right? But I'd say ten thousand hours. Um, like, if you want to get good at something, you know, and that's probably what I've come from. Hey, you know, we did a lot of science. You know, that expertise. Um, however. You know, ten. It would be ten thousand hours plus, right? And the plus for me is you got to get good at then how you sell the story, then how you influence, then how you yes. you know can you can have a great idea, but can you sell it, right? Yeah. Can you make it happen? Yeah. Can can you lead other people and make it happen? You know. Yeah. So so I guess it would be ten thousand hours plus, and the plus is the real yeah the bit yes. That's the difference between having your brilliant ideas adopted yeah. or not. Yeah. Exactly, or not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> brilliant. Well, um, I'm going to let you go. This has been, I have enjoyed this so much. <laughs> it's Same. been really great, really great. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Flabs. I really appreciate uh, hearing your story, your words of wisdom. Um, so, yeah, cheers. No. So great thanks Mel. thanks for the opportunity it's great to connect again and uh very reflective and cathartic so big thanks for the opportunity too you're welcome this podcast is brought to you by liberare consulting with editing provided by hawkins social if you enjoyed today's episode why not click on the subscribe button so you are the first to hear about new episodes we look forward to welcoming you back soon